All right, well, this hair with the center part is making me look more like a Austin heroine than I intended, and also 12. Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. So today is Friday, and we're continuing our discussion on Emma. I have my notes here on my little pad. Now, yesterday I told you that Emma is... Not my favorite Jane Austen novel. In fact, I said it was my least favorite Jane Austen novel. Now I'm about 10 or 11 chapters into the book and I'm going to have to amend that statement, but I honestly don't know what book to demote in its place. But let, let me get to my notes for today. So the first note that I have here is that Harriet Smith has two sentences of history. The novel gives two sentences and says, and that was all the history of Harriet, Harriet Smith. And that really speaks to the fact that you know, she is a bastard child, an illegitimate child, and we don't know where she came from, and she doesn't have a history as a result of that, as opposed to Emma, whose history comprises three, four chapters at the beginning of the novel, and that's just her personal history. That doesn't even really include her family history, and so that really draws out and speaks to that difference between the two of them. The other thing that I find really interesting is that Emma really doesn't choose an equal to be her friend. Now, I'm not talking about social status, although that's also true. In this social system of Regency England of the Romantic era that Austen is writing about, they are on different social statuses. But what they're also not equal in is in intellectual faculties. Emma is just way smarter than Harriet. So that combined with her social power means that Harriet is very pliable. She's someone that she can have a lot of influence and power over. And I just think it's really interesting that Emma would choose that type of person to be her companion, as opposed to someone who's really her equal. And even at the beginning of the, it must be like chapter five or chapter six, it sort of talks about what is the number one thing that Emma gained from this friendship? And it's a walking companion. And that really highlights that as well, that they're really not equally matched She's someone that she could summon at any time to go walking and have good exercise to fill in the gap for Miss Taylor, but only in that respect. Harriet is also a blank slate. Emma can kind of imagine whatever she wants about Harriet's history because there's nothing there and imagine a way she does. And here is where the novel gets meta because Emma is sort of imaginatively creating a different reality than what the narrator is going to create for Emma. And so I wonder if this is a little bit of an insight of what it's like to be an author, that you kind of get run away with your fancy and then sort of be abruptly checked by reality when it breaks through your imaginative world. And this is something that happens to Emma on small scale throughout the story. She's kind of constantly checked by reality. It's this one thing that she really can't have power over. Uh, and of course, the whole climax of the novel is her sort of coming into a deeper understanding of herself and the world around her. And <laughs> even when Emma initial, initially imagines sort of the Martin family and she's hearing about this family that Harriet has become friends with, she gets the couples wrong. She assumes that Mr. Martin is sort of like the senior father in the family. And it adds to, I mean, she's not actually crazy. Emma's not crazy, but it is, I mean, it's like, she's quite delusional. You know, she's, her imagination is so powerful that it's like really taking her out of reality. Oh, Mr. Knightley talks about Emma drawing up reading lists. I was actually doing that just last night. But because the other thing is that Emma assumes this very sort of traditionally masculine role of having power. So she symbolically sort of husbands everyone in her circle, not just Harriet. And Knightley even refers to this when he's talking with Mrs. Weston slash Miss Taylor, as was, about this new friendship that Emma is developing. And he talks about how Emma did a very good job of training Miss Taylor to sort of be a really great wife because she had to give up what she wanted and submit her will all the time. And so if Emma is to marry, then we have to have by the end of this novel a sort of feminizing force, or she has to marry someone who's very feminine to maintain her sort of traditionally masculine role. And I think I also want to take a little minute, minute to talk about Knightley's concern about this friendship and why it's a bad thing and kind of like bring it to like a, a, a current a current situation. One thing that I would say is advice that 
I think is really important to follow that I've heard before is like this idea of don't be the smartest person in the room, especially as a student, especially in like the college that you go to or the environment that you sort of hone your skills in, maybe even your work environment. This can be applied there too. And basically what it means is if you're consistently the smartest person in the room, then you're probably in the wrong room. It means that you need to leave this room and go to the room that's, you know, a level up or whatever, you, however you want to think about it. And basically what that means is that you're cutting your potential short. You're don't have any concept of what your potential could be formed into because you don't have any exemplars who are ahead of you. And I think that's really getting to the core of how you might take this little lesson that Knightley is giving on the side and apply it to everyday life. Another thing about the Harriet and Emma relationship is that Emma uses Harriet as a sort of sexual proxy, if you will, uh, <laughs> to work on her own romantic and sexual desires to work them out without taking any risks. So she sort of like sends her out and be, uh, says like, oh, what would it look like for you and Mr. Elton to be together? Oh, what would it look like for you and Ms. Uh, Frank Churchill to get together? What would it look like, you know, and she kind of goes down the line. And so part of what I think she's doing subconsciously is sort of working out her own romantic fantasies and her own sexual desires. Despite all the power that Emma has, she cannot command hearts. And for all the penetration that Emma has, she's particularly ignorant of herself. She makes reading lists that she will never follow through on. She paints a few portraits, but abandons the hobby. The novel is one of self-realization. In fact, it's structured a bit like a Greek tragedy in that we have a hero who is sort of swimming against the tide of fate, if you will. It's like, it's very obvious who Emma's going to be married to, who Emma should be with, as with many romance novels. So she's swimming sort of against the tide of fate, but the climax is not this question of will they get together or will they not get together. The climax of the novel is actually a moment of what's called anonorisis in Greek mythology and in Greek tragedy, and it's this revealing of the, the situation. It's sort of like this tragic moment, usually for the tragic hero, where they su suddenly realize all of their mistakes. Like Emma has to come to this moment where she realizes all of her mistakes that she's made. Um, and that's actually very much in line with the structure of a Greek tragedy. So the interesting thing that, Emma, that Austin has done with Emma is that she's taken the form of a comedic novel and sort of married it with the structure of a Greek tragedy. In that way, it sort of functions as a high burlesque. And I think that that's why we see this sort of like complex sort of unconscious psychology being worked out because the Greek tragedies are very psychological too. So for Emma, she has, as I mentioned last week, intertwined this love and death um, symbolism. So she has this fear of death, as we all do, but she's sort of unconsciously linked it with love and therefore marriage, which is why she declares that she doesn't want to get married. And that is sort of the psychology that's feeding into this Greek tragic situation, this Greek tragedy structure, right? And so much like, say, Oedipus, she's sort of emotionally and mentally blind. She's blind to herself. She's blind to her her intentions, what her truest desires are. She's blind to her faults, many of them. And uh, she has to sort of go through, like I said, this moment of anonorisis to have sort of the veil pulled back and to have this realization. Now in the tragic play of Oedipus, of course he sort of like symbolically stabs out his own physical eyes to represent his blindness as a character and how blind he's been, which thankfully is not the case for Emma because she has a true hazel eye. But that's part of like the, the the Greek tragic element kind of coming in. Where was I going with that? Oh, right. And so her, all of this sort of unconscious psychology around her love and fear, her death fear and intertwining that with love symbolism means that that's why she has to have like this split ego, which takes the form of you know, adopt co-opting, if you will, Harriet as a sort of doppelganger, a sexual doppelganger to sort of send out a golem to send out as an experiment in this new world of flirtation and romance that she's quite uncomfortable with, given how comfortable she is in every other area of her life. And if I were writing a paper, I would, I would write about that. Another area where Emma is sort of like 
you know, pushing against the boundaries of reality is when she encounters the letter that Mr. Martin has written to Harriet to propose marriage. And even though she has sort of set up this false caricature of who she thinks Robert Martin is, which is in fact quite false, and then she has to encounter the reality of who Mr. Martin is as he expresses himself in this letter, she is forced to recognize like, oh, this is a very well-written letter. Oh, this is, he expresses himself very clearly. Oh, there's no grammatical errors, which speaks to her sno snooty snootness, but then has to come back in and layer in this sort of imposed blindness, this sort of refusal to accept reality for what it is, which Again, I'm going to talk about Greek tragedy now that I've latched onto this idea for the next who knows how long until I finish this book. But just be prepared. Now it's all about Greek tragedy. So anyway, I'm so excited about this. This is so interesting. So those are my thoughts. Those are my thoughts on the book. And if I were writing a paper in an English class, that would be my thesis. That uh, Jane Austen is... Uh, synchronizing the forms of traditional comedy, which end, ends with marriage and babies, with that of the form of the Greek tragedy, leveraging Emma's blindness in a comic fashion, leading to anorexis at its climax, and therefore implicating this sort of like sexual repression, intertwining this romance, this this love imagery with death. That is not a thesis that anyone should ever write. I would have to edit that quite a bit. I'm not saying that's a good sentence. I'm not even sure that was a sentence, but there's so many ideas to pull together. Okay, that's what I've got for you today. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.